We just saw the front door adjustment, which helps us identify causal effects when we can't use the back door adjustment. And we'll now move on to Perl's do calculus. So here's an important question. Can we identify the causal effect if neither the backdoor criterion nor the front door criterion is satisfied? The answer is yes, and do calculus tells us how. Using Perl's do calculus, we'll be able to identify any causal quantity that is identifiable, keeping in mind that not all causal quantities are identifiable. There is a general, non-counterfactual causal quantity that you could be interested in. P of y given do t, comma, x, where here y, t, and x are arbitrary sets. They don't need to be scalars. So x could be many covariates, t could be multiple treatments, y could be multiple outcomes. Before we introduce the rules of do calculus, we have to show you a bit of notation. And we'll use this example graph G to illustrate this notation. The graph G X with a bar underneath the X refers to G where all edges going out of X are removed. The mnemonic to help you remember this is that if you think of parents as above their children, then you're cutting all of the edges that are going out of X with this line below X. Then if we look at G again, so we can look at g with x with a line over it. In this graph, as you might have guessed, we cut the edges above x. So that's g sub x with the line over x. The mnemonic is the same here. We're just cutting the edges that are above x when you think of parents as being above their children. And then if we added on z with a line below it here, we would just be cutting the outgoing edges of z. With that notation introduced, we can now show you the rules of do calculus, starting with the first rule of do calculus. This first rule is about when we can remove z here from behind the conditioning bar. We can do that when y is deseparated from z in the graph where the incoming edges to t are removed because we've done t here and we're conditioning on w. So it's deseparated given w and t. So that's rule one. That tells us when we can remove z from behind the conditioning bar. And my question for you is, what concept does this remind you of? What if we were to remove these do t's and change the graph to just g? Then we have this special case of rule one where t is the empty set. This is just regular deseparation, and this is what it implies. It implies conditional independence in the distribution, given the Markov assumption. So rule one is just a generalization of deseparation to interventional distributions. If you get the intuition for why deseparation implies conditional independence, then you get the intuition for rule one of do calculus. Let's now move on to the second rule of do calculus. So here is the second rule. And I have the same question for you again here. What concept that we've seen previously does this remind you of? If we apply the same trick as we did on the last slide of taking the treatment to be the empty set, then we get this special case of rule two. Hopefully, if you couldn't answer the question before, hopefully you can now. So what concept that we've already seen is this line here? This is the framing of the backdoor adjustment in terms of deseparation that we saw last week. So rule two of do calculus is a generalization of the backdoor adjustment slash backdoor criterion, where we've added this do t here. The final rule, rule three, is the trickiest rule, so we'll spend a bit more time on this one. This is rule three, where z of w denotes the set of nodes of z that aren't ancestors of any node of w in the manipulated graph. 
All right, so to try to understand the intuition for this rule, we're going to do the same thing as always. Let's remove these interventions on T. So consider the special case where T is the empty set. That gives us this. So if Y is de-separated from Z by W in the graph where we remove incoming edges to ZW, then we can just remove the intervention on Z. So here, P of Y given do Z comma W is the same as P of Y given W. Okay, so to think about how we might get this, let's consider the association that's flowing to Y. So in this graph, there's association flowing from Z to Y only along directed paths. That's because the graph associated with this quantity, there are no incoming edges to Z. So we only need to worry about causal association, association flowing from Z to Y along directed paths. So we can remove the do Z to get this quantity if there is no causal association flowing from Z to Y. If there are no unblocked causal paths from Z to Y. So under what conditions would there be no causal association flowing from Z to Y? You might think it would be when Y is de-separated from Z by W in the graph where we've removed incoming edges to Z. Because when we remove incoming edges to Z, the only association between Z and Y is causal association. So if they're de-separated, then they're is no causal association. You might have this equality. So why do we have this weird ZW here, where ZW denotes the, not quite, not quite Z, it denotes the set of nodes of Z that aren't ancestors of any node of W in the manipulated graph where we removed edges in going to T. So what's going on here? Why do we have z of w instead of z. First, if you don't understand the intuition for why you might expect z here, then go ahead and pause and think a bit about that to convince yourself why I'm saying it might make sense for z to be there. Now, to see why we have z of w instead of z for this rule, we're going to have to consider colliders. So colliders are the key here. To see that, consider this graph. Here I'm using ZW to refer to a node in Z that is an ancestor of a node in W. And I have W conditioned on here, right? So W is behind the conditioning bar. And because W is conditioned on, and because it's a descendant of this collider here, there is a path of association. So there's association flowing from A to ZW to B to Y. So Y is the key variable that we care about here. We want to know under what conditions do Z does not affect Y at all, right? So when can we remove D do Z from behind the conditioning bar and not affect the distribution of Y? And in this graph, we just established that Y will have association flowing into it all the way from A, A to ZW to B to Y. And if we were to just have deseparation between Y and Z in the graph where all the edges are deleted from every node in Z, then we would be killing that path, right? Because ZW is a node in Z. So we really could have that the distribution of y changes when I do z if I only have deseparation between y and z in this graph. That's why we need to consider the nodes in z that are not ancestors of the conditioned on w because then they won't be, you know, potential colliders. And then if we don't condition on these kinds of nodes, we can keep this path intact. That's why this criterion is only with the nodes in Z that are 
not ancestors of W, and it's not this criterion here. So this is the more general version of rule three when we add in this do T here. And that's the intuition for why rule three of do calculus is true. This is a bit of a tricky one, so you might want to pause here and think more about this to kind of help cement that intuition. And those are the rules of do calculus. We use these rules to identify causal quantities. In other words, we take some causal estimate and remove do operators from it, turning it into a statistical estimate. As an example of using these rules, we give a proof of the front door adjustment using the rules of do calculus in section 6.2.1 of the course book. We gave a proof of the same result using the truncated factorization in section 6.1, so you can compare the proofs using the rules of do calculus versus using the truncated factorization. So that's all great, but recall that we started this section noting that the backdoor adjustment and the frontdoor adjustment were ways to identify causal effects, but the backdoor criterion and the frontdoor criterion are not necessary criterions, right? So even though they give us identifiability, if they're not satisfied, that doesn't mean that we don't have identifiability. And maybe it's the same with the rules of do calculus. Maybe there are some causal estimates that are identifiable, but that we can't identify using the rules of do calculus. Well, it turns out that that's not the case. Fortunately, do calculus is complete. In other words, if a causal estimate can be identified, if it's identifiable, then we'll be able to do it using some sequence of applications of the rules of do calculus. You can look into these papers for more information and the proofs on that. And these proofs are constructive, which importantly means that they admit polynomial time algorithms for identification. So we can automate identification. With that, we can conclude the section on do calculus and move to this question. What concepts are the first and second rules of do calculus generalizations of? You should be able to use your answer to this question to easily remember the first and second rules of do calculus and why they're true.